FLM, wide open thinking, world-class work, and far-reaching results. Now with locations in Minneapolis, Columbus, Indianapolis, and Washington, D.C. A strategic marketing and communications company dedicated to serving clients who specialize in the business of agriculture and the life of rural communities. Thank you for joining us for our AgriPulse Washington Week interview. I'm Spencer Chase, joined as always by AgriPulse Senior Editor Phil Brasher, discussing the week that was, agriculturally speaking, in Washington, D.C. And big news out of Washington this week, something that's been coming for, for quite a while now, several years, in fact. Uh, this week, or today, a matter of fact, uh, recording this on a Thursday evening, uh, USDA and HHS jointly released the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. Uh, that is a uh, dietary report that really just guides federal food policy for the next five years. It was expected by end of January, but mm -hmm. some things delayed that. Uh, I believe HHS paid lip service to the fact that they were trying to uh, align it with uh, folks' New Year's resolutions. And so, moral of the story is the report came out this week. Um, the reason that there's so much upheaval about this report, uh, some when the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, which is a group of scientists that kind of advises this report, was drafting a uh, just an advisory report of sorts, they included some language regarding sustainability as well as some language uh, kind of suggesting a decrease in the intake of lean meat. So with that, the report itself, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans that came out today, uh, did not include any language about sustainability, did discuss lean meat, and had some conversation in there regarding added sugars, Phil. Right. Uh, well, I think the two big messages that I saw coming out of this, having watched these uh, dietary guidelines, I think this is the third or fourth that I've, mm -hmm. I've watched, I'm dating myself, but a couple of uh, interesting messages to me. One is they came out with an actual limit on added sugars. This has been an issue for for years, uh, decades actually, in terms of, uh, of sugars and uh, whether the dietary guidelines had actually come out and uh, put a limit on how much sugar uh, Americans uh, should consume. They said 10% of 10% uh, of calories. Really, nothing was much said about it. It's, it's really gone away as terms of a real controversial issue. There wasn't a lot of pushback on Capitol Hill uh, from 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 the industry uh, as as the administration was considering this. I think it probably goes to show how the debate on sugar and uh, probably Americans' concerns with diabetes and obesity have changed over the last uh, uh, decade or so. The other big message that you mentioned was uh, that you've been covering for months now, mm -hmm. Spencer, was on meat. What was interesting to me is that uh, while they, they did talk about uh, some groups uh, of the population uh, need, needing to cut back on red meat, processed meat. They really focused their recommendations this time on some groups of the population, not just the population at large. And that was uh, men and teenage boys, uh, they said, could, uh, could, could consume less, uh, less red meat. Yeah, <laughs> really, really kind of advised to lower their protein intake. And as a, as a young man myself, I kind of resemble that remark. But we'll get to that at a later date. <laughs> well, we'll see. I'm not sure those groups are the, the most likely to take that advice. But that's, we'll that's also a fair point. <laughs> and something this guidelines did that was different from its previous iterations is it didn't so much say, you know, eat X amount of grams of this nutrient and X amount of grams of this other nutrient. They really said, here are a bunch of dietary patterns that you as an American citizen can align yourself with, find one that works best for you. Really trying to make sure, because the, the percentage of Americans that follow the dietary guidelines is not particularly high. I mean, it is a document, to, it is a set of policies that does advise things like uh, like senior meal plans, like SNAP, like the, the school nutrition. But uh, outside of those parameters, it doesn't have great participation. So they're really trying to reach out. And Phil, you mentioned this in some emails today, a lot more positive language, like maybe shifts to this kind of nutrient or that kind of nutrient. So I mean, they're not necessarily you know trying to be the eat your vegetables government that, uh, yeah. that they may have been perceived of yeah. as in the past. Well, the government was struggling for years and health professionals and how do you get people to actually change their diets uh, and, and the scolding approach uh, obviously doesn't work. Uh, we're all struggling one with, in one way or another. And yeah, I think there definitely was an attempt to, to put a positive message out there that will then be conveyed by your doctor uh, your nutritionist, uh, dietitian, so forth. So that's the issue for the time being until they begin drafting of the 2020 guidelines. 
kind of seems to be put to bed based on my uh, juvenile reporter eyes. That's kind of the way I see it. So we'll shift gears a little bit here and talk to you some action that happened on Capitol Hill um, that could be a signal of some things coming uh, later on. Uh, today, uh, this week, the uh, the House, which is the only chamber in town, Senate is not expected in town until later. Um, the House voted to uh, send a Obamacare repeal bill to the president's desk. Obviously, it's going to be subject to a veto, but Phil, what does this mean and what broader agricultural implications could this, could this House Republican strategy have for agriculture? Well, what's going to happen this year, and you're going to see them both in the House and the Senate, an, an effort to set a political message. This is an election year. It was a presidential election, huge stakes. Republicans want to do two things. They want to make the case for electing a Republican president, and they want to make the case for uh, retaining a Republican uh, Congress, uh, control of both the House and the Senate. And so they are going to be bringing up a lot of bills uh, over the next weeks, months, that uh, they know won't pass or they know will be vetoed by the president. But th they want to send a message that to the voters that, um, look, we're one, we're active, we're trying, we're trying to kill Obamacare, we're trying to kill regulations, but we can't do it with a president who's, who's going to veto it, or a Senate which has, uh, is controlled by, uh, in which they don't have 60 votes to move a lot of uh, legislation. Uh, next week, on uh, Wednesday, the House is scheduled to take up a, a resolution to kill the waters of the U.S. rule, something we've been talking about a lot. Right. Um, that will pass the House, uh, probably something short, though, of a two-thirds majority that would be needed to overturn a veto. But it uh, will send the message in the Republicans' uh, eyes to, to voters that, uh, okay, we need a Republican president if, if, uh, if, if we're going to get rid of rules like this. So last time Congress was in town was that November, December, just fury of activity that they right. had. Going to see kind of a contradiction to that uh, going into 2016. I mean, I don't think anyone was expecting, you know, an election year to just be really uh, a lot of things get done on Capitol Hill. But sounds like this is going to be kind of the strategy that we're going to see maybe up and through uh, up until the lame duck session. Right, right. Uh, we have a short calendar this year, actually, because we have the, the party conventions in, in the middle of the summer, then we have the August recess. So anything that's going to happen legislatively uh, before the election is going, to happen hap is going to have to happen between now, really, and July the 4th. I want to mention a couple of bills, although most of what uh, Congress is going to be doing this year could probably fall in this uh, category of politics mm -hmm. and messaging, message sending. A uh, couple of things we're really going to be keeping a close eye on is uh, very soon uh, the Senate Agriculture Committee is going to take up a child nutrition reauthorization bill. Uh, it looks like the House is going to uh, uh, work on its uh, own version of this. It's a good chance this, is, this could get uh, enacted this year. The other issue, GMO labeling, uh, it's a very, the industry is uh, uh, very interested in seeing legislation passed to uh, prevent uh, state labeling uh, laws from taking effect. The first, the first one is set up in July in Vermont, uh, so that's a deadline really that, uh, for, for Congress to act. And it'll be interesting to see if there's any state legislatures uh, going on here in the next six months before that one in Vermont is enacted. You know, there's nothing saying another state couldn't bring up a, a GMO labeling right. bill of its own, which is uh, kind of what the industry is calling for when they're asking Congress to create some kind of national preemption situation. So we'll be sure to follow that situation because it's definitely been unfolding for, for a while now, and it's definitely going to have a lot of implications mm -hmm. to really the entire agricultural supply and value chain. So we talk about a lot of messaging votes that are going to be going on uh, here in Capitol Hill. And our message to you is that we're thankful that you uh, chose to watch this video. Uh, we certainly appreciate you uh, stopping by agripulse.com for all of your ag policy coverage needs. For Phil Brasher, I'm Spencer Chase. Have a good one. Thank you.